Hi guys and welcome to this A-level math set A paper one exam walkthrough. So this is a paper that I have put together myself so you shouldn't really have seen any of these um, questions specifically. Obviously some of these will be very typical of what you would see in a regular A-level maths exam. So this is designed based on the Edexcel specification. Obviously this has nothing to do with Pearson Edexcel themselves and um, like I said it's just a paper that I've put together myself. If you want to you can think about this almost like a predictive paper for the 2023 exams. It isn't really a predictive paper, obviously no one can predict the exact topics, um, but obviously you can use this as exam revision. So obviously don't just use this um, as your sole revision, um, but as a supplement to your um, full revision. I think this would be quite a useful um, revision resource. So what I'm going to do is just walk through all the questions in this paper. If you are looking for more worksheets, um, revision videos, and more predictive papers, then I'm going to be uploading paper two and paper three as well before the 2023 exams. And be sure to check out our website at ajmaths.co.uk. So that's everything that we need there for our introduction. So let's get started here with paper um, one for set A. Starting off with question one now, we have a sequence u1, u2, u3, and so on. And this is defined by u1 equals k, and then u of n plus 1. So the next term in the sequence, that is equal to three lots of the previous term, un plus 4. So for the first part here, part A, we have to find u2 in terms of k. Let's do part A up here. So for u2 here, then in this case here, that would be three lots of the previous term, so it would be three lots of u1. So three lots of u1 plus 4. We know that u1 here is equal to k, so u2 here will be equal to the three lots of u1, which is k, so we get 3k there, and don't forget the plus 4. Okay, and there we have it, so nice and straightforward. That's all we simply need there for part A, so that's u2 in terms of k. That's part A. Moving on to B now. So for B here, we have to show that this summation from R equals 1 to 4 of UR is a multiple of 8. So for this summation here, let me just write down this summation. From R equals 1 to 4 of UR. And what we're doing here is U1 plus U2 plus U3 plus u4. Okay, that's what this sigma notation here tells us, this summation notation. So we know u1, that's k. We know u2, that's 3k plus 4. So what we need here now is u3 and u4. And we're going to add everything together and hopefully we should be able to show that that is a multiple of 8. So u1, like we've already said, that is simply k. u2 then, that is 3k plus 4. So now we need to find u3 here. So u3, using this recurrence relation here, so this would be 3 lots of u2. 3 lots of u2 plus 4. That will be 3 lots of 3k plus 4. 3 lots of 3k plus 4. And don't forget the plus 4 here at the very end. In this case here, we're going to get 9k plus 12. Get 9k plus 12 there, and don't forget the plus 4. If we simplify this here then, we get 9k plus 16 there. Okay, so that's u3. We now need to do this one more time here to find u4. So u4 here, let's do it over here actually. So u4. That'll be three lots of u3, so three lots of the previous term. And we add four. It'll be three lots of 9k plus 16. Three lots of 9k plus 16, and then plus the four on as well. We evaluate this here. Three times 9k, that's 27k. Three times 16 here, that would give me um, 48 there. Well, then don't forget the plus 4 here. In this case here, then u4 is equal to 27k plus 52 there. Okay. What we need to do now is take all of these terms here, so u1, u2, u3, and u4, add those together, 
and hopefully we can show that that is a multiple of 8. So in that case then, u1 plus u2 plus u3 plus u4, that's going to be equal to um, k here, u1 is k, and we're adding u2 which is 3k plus 4. 3k plus 4 and we've got u3 here which is 9k plus 16 9k plus 16 and then finally u4 here which is 27k plus 52 now if we add all these together here and simplify so k plus 3k plus 9k plus 27k that gives us 40k that's 40k and finally 4 plus 16 plus 52 that gives us 72 there so the summation here and this summation here so from r equals 1 to 4 of ur that is equal to 40k plus 72 so in this case here then we want to show that this is a multiple of 8 we just want to factor an 8 out here we can write this here then as 8 lots so 8 lots of 5k plus 9 because we can factor the a out here this must mean that this summation from r equals 1 to 4 of ur must be a multiple of a so therefore if i try the conclusion over here r equals 1 to 4 of ur this is a multiple of a okay as soon as you can show this point here that you can factor the a out we've shown that this summation here is a multiple of a Okay, and there we have it. So that's the solution there to question one. Taking a look now at question two here, we've got two functions to begin with. So we've got the functions f and g, and they're defined below here, like you can see. So for the first part here, part a, we're asked to show that the composite function fg of x is equal to kx, where k is a constant to be found. So let's see if we can find this composite function here to begin with. So for f g of x here, this composite function that we're looking to find, remember now we work from right to left, so the function g here goes into the function f. So in that case I'm going to get 4 ln e to the power of minus x, like so. Now this isn't my solution here, we need to do a bit of work to get it into this form here. So using the basic properties now of logarithms and exponentials, what I can do here now is apply the power rule. I can bring this minus 1 down in front with a 4. That would give me minus 4 there. ln e to the power of x there. Okay. So again, just using basic properties now for logarithms and exponentials. If we have the natural logarithm of e to the x, that would simply give me x there. So what I've got here then is minus 4 times x, giving us minus 4x there. Okay. And notice at this point here then, this is fg of x composite function that we're looking to find and it's now in the form here of kx so in this case here then k is equal to minus over there okay and there we have it so that's the solution there to a moving on to b now for the function h now so we've got a new function here the function h and that's defined such that h of x is equal to 3 e to the power of x minus 1 where x belongs to the real numbers so for part b then, we have to state the range of h. So only one mark for this, we shouldn't really expect too much work here. So what you're basically considering in here now is the behaviour of this function h as x tends to negative infinity and positive infinity. Okay, so just remember the range of a function, that's the possible outputs for that function. So like we said then, if we just consider what happens here as um, x tends to negative infinity and positive infinity, so as x tends to negative infinity here, then in this case, this part here, 3e to the power of, just think about that as a really large number, that would be 0. That part there would be 0. That would just leave me with them with 0 minus 1, giving us minus 1. So h of x tends to minus 1. And then as x tends to positive infinity, in this case here, h of x, this would just tend to infinity as well, so positive infinity there. Okay. 
So how do we now define the range here? Well, we just need values here for our function h of x being greater than minus one. Okay, so therefore for the range here, we get that h of x is strictly greater than minus one. Okay. If it helps do a sketch for that question, um, you know, you might be able to see that a little bit easier with a sketch. Um, but I don't really think it's too necessary just for part B that, like we said, it is only one mark. Um, so just thinking about that, the behavior as of the function h there as x tends to negative infinity and positive infinity there. Okay, so that's the solution to B. And then finally, we've got C here. So let's just clear everything that we've got here to begin with. So for C now, it's a nice little part here to finish with. We're asked to solve h of x equals 17. So h of x here, that's 3e to the power of x minus 1. So 3e to the power of x minus 1 equals 17. So now I'm going to add 1 to both sides here. So I get 3e to the power of x is equal to 18. I'm now going to divide both sides by 3 here. And then I'm going to get e to the power of x is equal to 18 over 3. So that would give me 6 there. And then don't forget here, all we simply want is x on its own. If I want x on its own here, I'm now going to take the natural logarithm here of both sides. If I take the natural logarithm here of e to the power of x, so the natural logarithm of e to the power of x, and whatever we do to one side, make sure we do it to the other side as well. Get ln of 6 here. So the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of e to the power of x there, I mean we already saw that in was it part a, that would just simply give us x on its own there. Therefore we get x. And that's going to be equal to the natural logarithm of 6 there. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution there to C. And that gives us the solution there to question 2. Same look now at question 3 here. I've got the point M, which has coordinates of 10 minus 1. And this lies on the circle C here with center 3, minus 2, and radius R. So for the first part here, part A, we're asked to find the exact value of the radius here, R, given our answer in its simplest form. So how do we answer this question here? Well, we know the coordinates of the center here, that's 3 minus 2. And we know a point here on the circumference of this circle C. So this point here, M, that's 10 minus 1. So if it helps it, let's just do a quick sketch. You don't need to do a sketch here, but I think it might help just um, illustrate this problem here that we're looking to solve. My x axis there. So the center here is 3 minus 2. So let's say that's 3 minus 2 there. So let me just say my circle looks, say, like this. Um, let me say that's the center of the circle there. So that's the center. That would be 3 minus 2 there. We then have the point M here, which has coordinates of 10 minus 1. Let's just say that's here. Okay, so 10 units along, down 1, so 10 minus 1 there. Okay, so we're now looking to find the exact value of r. So from the center here to this point, this line here is actually the radius. Don't forget, from the center here to a point on the circumference, that just forms the radius. So this here, this line, is actually r. So what we need to do here now is just find the length of this line. Okay, the length of the radius. So what we're looking to do is find the distance here between these two points. So using the distance formula here, distance, don't forget, that would be the square root of the difference here in the x coordinates. So x2 minus x1 squared. And we do the same here with the y coordinates. It's going to be y2 minus y1 all squared. So in our case, then, if we apply this formula here, let's just call it r. This would be the square root, then. So let's do it as this being x2, y2, this being x1, y1. So it's going to be 10 minus 3. And then we square that. Doing the same here now with the y coordinate. So it's now going to be minus 1, minus, minus 2 here. So just be very, very careful with the signs. So minus 1, minus, minus 2. That's the same as minus 1 plus 2 there. And then we square that. So minus 1, 
plus 2 there and we square that. So we evaluate this here, r is equal. That would be 7 squared. We've got 7 squared there. Minus 1 plus 2, that's going to be 1 squared. So 7 squared plus 1 squared there. So in that case then r is equal to the square root here of 49 plus 1. 49 plus 1, giving us the square root of 50 there. Okay, so in that case then, the radius here is equal to the square root of 50. But be very careful here, we need to make sure that we give the answer in its simplest form. The square root of 50 here, can we simplify that? Well, we can in this case. I can write this here as the square root of 25 times the square root of 2. So the square root of 25 is equal to 5. In that case, then we get 5 root 2 there. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution to um, part A there. So that's the radius. So R is equal to 5 root 2 there. So we move on to B now. Just a one mark question here. So hence or otherwise, find an equation for the circle C. So we already know the coordinates here of the center. So that makes this question or this part here nice and easy. We now know the radius here as well. So I define it here as x minus a all squared plus y minus b all squared is equal to r squared then. So I'm going to get x. So the x coordinate here is 3, so that must be x minus 3 all squared. Then I'm going to get y. So if this is minus 2 here, this must be minus minus 2, so that would give me plus 2 there. And again, that's all squared, and that's equal to r squared. So if r is the square root of 50, and this must simply be the square root of 50 squared, giving us 50 there. Okay, so you can see not much work to that. That's the only reason why it's just one mark there. So that's B. So we take a look at C now. Um, and actually, let's just clear a bit of room here for C. So for C then, we're told that the circle C crosses the x-axis at two points, A and B. And we're asked to find the coordinates of A and B. So if it's crossing the x-axis here, so again, if you just think about a quick sketch, if you've got a circle here that looks, say, like this, it'll cross the x-axis here when y is equal to 0. So when y equals 0 here, when y equals 0 then, so all I'm going to do here now is substitute that into the equation of my circle here. Let me just write down the equation of the circle again. So my circle here is x minus 3 all squared plus y plus 2 all squared and that's equal to 50. So when y is equal to 0 here, all we're going to do now is substitute that into this equation here for the circle. I get x minus 3 all squared, that won't change. We then get 0 plus 2 all squared, so that's just going to be 2 squared there. And that's equal to 50. Okay, so 2 squared there, that's 4. So I get x minus 3 all squared plus 4 is equal to 50. So we'll track 4 now off both sides. So I get x minus 3 all squared. That's going to be equal to 46 there. So just subtracting 4 off both sides. So now we want to solve for x here. So what I'm going to do now is take the square root here of both sides. In that case, I'm going to get x minus 3 going to be equal to plus or minus. Don't forget the plus or minus here for the square root of 46. And then finally, we can obtain the x solution here then by adding 3 to both sides. So x is equal to 3 plus or minus the square root of 46 there. Now, we're not done here because we're looking for the coordinates of a and b. So just make sure that you give these now as coordinates here. So for the coordinates then, well, I'm going to get 3 minus the square root of 46. So 3 minus the square root of 46. And don't forget here the y coordinate. That's when, well, basically we found that when y is 0. So my y coordinate here will just simply be 0. So we get 3 minus the square root of 46. And we also have 3 plus the square root of 46. And again, have zero for the other y coordinate there okay and there we have it so that's the solution there to c and that gives the solution there to question three
Moving on to question four now, so we have a chemical substance which is cooling down with its temperature T degrees Celsius being modelled by this given exponential model here. And we're also told that little t here is the time in minutes since the recording of measurements began. So for the first part here, I have to briefly explain why little t is greater than or equal to zero. Now there's only one mark for this, so we shouldn't really expect too much work here. And I'm hoping the answer seems kind of obvious. So little t here is the time in minutes, let's just write that down. Little t is time in minutes. So time in minutes. So therefore, little t can't be negative. That can't be negative. Obviously, we can't go back in time. But in that case, then, therefore, t must be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. And we only need something like that there just to get us the one mark for part A. So there we have it, so that's the solution to A. Let's take a look now at B here. So part B says, explain why the temperature of the chemical substance will always be greater than 20 degrees Celsius. So let me just write down the exponential model here. We have T equals 30 E to minus T over 20. Then we've got plus 20 here. Now, if we, want, if we want to show here that the temperature of the chemical substance will always be greater than 20 degrees Celsius, then I need to think about this exponential model here in two parts. We've got the constant term here, the plus 20. And I have the term here that involves the exponential function. Now, the constant term here is plus 20. If you think about this here, we're looking to show that the temperature is always greater than 20. And we have this constant term here of 20 on its own. Then all I need to show here now is this exponential part here will be strictly greater than zero. Okay, so it's always going to be positive. So in that case, then, if we can show that this is a value greater than zero, then no matter how large or small that is, we're always adding something to 20. And in that case, then it will always be greater than 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, but we need to show here. We need to show that 30 e minus t over 20 is strictly greater than zero. Okay, like we said, we're going to add something um, or something positive, and it could be either very large or very small. But the key point is that we're adding something to the 20 there that will always be greater than 20 degrees Celsius. So how do we show here that this must be strictly greater than zero? Well, what I'm going to do to begin with here is set this equal to zero now. So I've got 30 e minus t over 20, and that is equal to zero. So now we're looking to solve for t here. So I'm going to divide both sides by 30. So I get e to the power of minus t over 20 there. That would be equal to zero divided by 30. So that would give me zero again. So like we said here, we're looking to solve for t. So I'm now going to take the natural logarithm here of both sides. I'm going to get minus t over 20. Get minus t over 20. And that's going to be equal to the natural logarithm of zero. And this is where we arrive at an issue now. So the natural logarithm of zero here, hopefully you're aware that this would be an error. Okay, so if you put that into your calculator, your calculator will return an error. Okay, so we can't compute this value here. And what that's basically showing us here then is this original expression here, or this original equation here, if we start at this line here, then it's showing that there's no value of t, such that this left-hand side here is equal to the right-hand side. So this can't be equal to zero here. And the key point here is then that basically my natural logarithm here must be of a positive number. Okay. In that case, then that must be strictly greater than zero. Okay. If that's equal to zero or less than zero, then at each point here would be either taking the natural logarithm of zero, if it's equal to zero like this, or if it's less than zero, then in that case, we'd be taking the natural logarithm of a negative number. And again, that returns an error. So in this case here, then this shows. Therefore, this shows that 30 e to the power of minus t over 20 must be greater than zero. So 30 e to the power of minus t over 20 is greater than zero. And therefore, the temperature here, t, that represents the temperature here, like we can see from the, you know, the text at the beginning of the question, 
that must be always greater than 20 degrees. Let's just write this down here. So T will always be greater than 20 degrees Celsius. We're in that room a little bit, but there we have it. So I like can see just breaking it down part by part there. Now it is also worth mentioning that that isn't the only way to show um, the solution to be there. You could also use a graphical approach. So sketch the model here and just show that we have an asymptote approaching at 20 there. Obviously it never touches 20, but it will always just be um, above 20 there. That's the way you could do it. Um, I like to take this approach here just for part B there. Okay, so there we have it. So that's the solution to B. We'll just clear the screen now just so we can have a go at part C here. So for part C then, it says find the starting temperature of the chemical substance. So the starting temperature here would be when T, little t here, is zero. So little t equals zero here. So all I'm going to do now is substitute little t into my exponential model here. Therefore, capital T is going to be equal to 30. This would now be to the power of minus um, 0 over 20. So 0 over 20 it would just be 0. So I'm going to get 30 to the power of 0. Plus the 20 there. So don't forget now that anything to the power of 0 here is equal to 1. So I've got 30 times 1 giving me 30. Plus 20. And we get 50 there. Okay, so the temperature here um, in degrees Celsius, that would be 50 degrees Celsius there. That's the solution to C. So we take a look now at the very last part here, part D. We have to find the time at which the temperature of the chemical substance is 40 degrees Celsius, giving our answer to one decimal place. What we know now is capital T here is equal to 5. So replacing capital T here now with 40 for this model. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write this right hand side here on the left hand side, just so when I'm solving that, um, I'm solving for T on the left hand side. It doesn't really matter, it's just how I prefer to solve the equation here. I've got 30 e power of minus t over 20 plus 20 and that's equal to 40 now because we know the temperature here, the chemical substance is 40 degrees Celsius. That's equal to 40. So from here now we're just looking to solve for t. So to begin with I'm going to subtract 20 off both sides. Get 30 e to the power of minus t over 20. That's going to be equal to 40 minus 20, giving me 20 there. So now I'm going to divide by this coefficient here. So I'm going to divide both sides by 30. I'm going to get e to the power of minus t over 20. And that's going to be equal to 2 over 3. So 20 over 30, same as 2 over 3. So now, like we said here, we're just looking to solve for t. So we need to get rid of the exponential function here. And to do that, we take the natural logarithm of both sides. I'm going to get minus t over 20. Minus t over 20 is going to be equal to natural logarithm 2 over 3 there. So now, again, just looking to solve for t here, I'm going to times both sides by 20. Therefore, we get that minus t is equal to 20 ln 2 over 3. And then finally here, we just want t on its own. That's what we're looking for here, the time. And just divide both sides by minus 1. So we get minus 20 ln 2 over 3 there. Okay. Obviously, we're not looking for this in its exact form like this. We're actually looking for this now to one decimal place. All you need to do here now is just put this into your calculator. If you do that correctly, what you should get here to one decimal place is 8.1. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution to D. And that gives the solution there to question 4. Moving on to question 5 here, so we've got this function f of x which is equal to 2x minus 1 all squared over x minus 2. So for part a here, we're to find f prime of x in this form here, where ax and bx are fully factorised quadratic expressions. So what you hopefully notice straight away with this function here, f of x, is this is expressed as a quotient of functions. So to differentiate f of x here and get f prime of x, you need to use the quotient rule. So let's say we've got y equals, well, let's change that to function notation, since we're working with a function here. Let's say we've got f of x is equal to u over v. 
Now, don't forget as well that the quotient rule here is given in the formula book, so you don't really have to worry about memorizing it. But to begin with here, let's just state the result that we're going to need here. So f prime of x. This is given then as v times u prime. So v times u prime. Then we subtract u times v prime. And then we divide all of this here by v squared. Okay. So in this case here for this function f of x, my u would be 2x minus 1 all squared. So u is 2x minus 1 all squared. And v here, that would be my denominator of x minus 2. What I also need here then is u prime and v prime, like we can see here in this result for the quotient rule. So u prime, this requires the use of the chain rule now to differentiate here. So I'm going to get 2 times the derivative then of 2x minus 1, so that would also be 2. I get 2 times 2, which is 4. Then we times this here by 2x minus 1, and don't forget we reduce this power here by 1. That would just simply be 4 times 2x minus 1 there. We can also express this here as ax minus 4. That's u prime. And then v prime here, nice and straightforward, that would simply be 1 there. Okay. So we've got everything that we need here now to find f prime of x. So f prime of x here. Well, to begin with, we have v times u prime. So we've got v here, which is x minus 2, times that by u prime, which is ax minus 4. We get x minus 2 times ax minus 4. And then we subtract here, so minus u times v prime. So u is 2x minus 1 all squared times by v prime, which is 1. I simply get there minus 2x minus 1 all squared. And then finally here, this is all over v squared. So v is x minus 2. This is all over x minus 2 squared. Okay. So... We're not done here because we have found f prime of x, but we've not got it into this form here of ax over bx, where ax and bx are fully factorized quadratic expressions. So to get it into this form here, what we need to do is simplify the numerator here. And we can't do anything with the denominator as it is. So we don't need to worry about the denominator, but like we said, let's expand these um, double brackets here now and here. And if we do that over here, just so we've got enough room then. So we've got f prime of x here. So expanding these little brackets first, and you can use any method here that you're familiar with. So x times ax, that would give me ax squared. And then got x times minus 4, so that would give me minus 4x. And then got minus 2 times ax, that would give me minus 16x there. And then minus 2 times minus 4, that would give me positive 8 there. We get plus 8. Now, for this double bracket here, let's just be um, slightly careful here. I've got 2x minus 1 all squared. That's 2x minus 1 all squared, so that's the same as 2x minus 1 times 2x minus 1. So, the reason why I'm doing this separately up here is because we have this minus here as well, and this can cause um, a lot of issues. So, let's just expand these to begin with. So, 2x times 2x gives me 4x squared. I've then got 2x times minus 1, so that's minus 2x. And we get the same here, so minus 1 times 2x giving me minus 2x. And then finally here, minus 1 times minus 1, that would give me plus 1 there. And if I just simplify this here, I get 4x squared minus 4x plus 1. So what we need to account for here now is this minus. So I'm then going to get minus 4x squared. Because this is now is minus 4x, if you do minus minus 4x, that becomes positive, so that becomes plus 4x. And then finally here, we've got plus 1, minus plus 1 would be minus 1. And that's just why I'm saying be very, very careful here. So that's why I've done that separately up there, just to deal with this minus here. And all of this here then is over um, x minus 2 all squared. Just do this over here 
x minus 2 all squared. I know this isn't the neatest, by the way, but we will get the solution. So that's all that matters. So here we just simplify the numerator here one more time. 8x squared minus 4x squared. So that would give me 4x squared there. We then got minus 4x minus 16x and plus 4x. So they'll just cancel. So I just get left there with minus 16x. Get minus 16x. And we've got plus 8 here, minus 1, and that would give me plus 7. I get 4x squared minus 16x plus 7 as my numerator. This is all over x minus 2 all squared. But we're still not done here, um, just because we haven't got it into this form here. So ax over bx. Because ax here, this is a quadratic, but it's not in its fully factorized form. Okay. So if I just factorize this quadratic here, we're done then with part A. So factorizing this quadratic here, you can use your calculator if your calculator will um, factorize a quadratic like this. If not, you'll just have to do it by hand. Um, but it's nothing too challenging, I don't think. So if you factorize this quadratic here, obviously we'll get double brackets. What I get here then, is I get 2x minus 7. I get 2x minus 1. That's all over x minus 2 all squared. Like so. And there we have it. So we've now got it in this form here. So I've got my ax and my bx here, which are both fully factorized quadratic expressions there. Okay. That's the solution to a. So let's just clear the room um, or the screen here just so we have a bit more room, I should say. Clearing that there. So to finish question five now, if we take a look at part B, it says hence or otherwise find the range of i's of x for which f of x is increasing. So to answer part B here, what we need is f prime of x is strictly greater than zero. Because to find the range of i's of x for which f of x is increasing, we need to solve this inequality here. Now don't forget we found f prime of x in part A, so we don't need to worry about finding that again. So let's just remind ourselves here of f prime of x since we've just cleared the screen. So f prime of x, that is equal to 2x minus 7 times 2x minus 1. And that's all over x minus 2 all squared. So in that case here then, my f prime of x is this expression here. So I've got 2x minus 7. times 2x minus 1. That's all over x minus 2 all squared. And we're setting this inequality here to be greater than 0. Okay. So to solve this here, what I'm going to do to begin with is multiply both sides of this inequality here by x minus 2 all squared. On the left hand side here, we get 2x minus 7. We get 2x minus 7 times 2x minus 1. And on my right hand side here for this inequality, well, we get 0 times x minus 2 all squared. And that would still be 0. Okay, so this is all greater than 0. And what I've got here then is a quadratic inequality. So all I need to do now is just solve this quadratic inequality here. And it's already factorized. Um, that's what we did in part A just to help us here then in part B. So factorizing this here, um, or it's already in its factorized form. So what I would recommend doing here is just doing a quick sketch just so you can see what we're actually looking at. So I just quickly sketch this problem here. Won't be perfect, but that's my y-axis here. This is my x-axis here. So we'd have two solutions here. I'd have a solution at x equals a half from this factor here. So x equals a half. I have a solution here from this factor of x equals 7 over 2. Okay, so a half would say be here. That's a half. My other factor or my solution here would be 7 over 2. Okay, so if I just quickly sketch it here, it won't be perfect, but let's just say it looks, say, something like this. Okay, like that. Let's just move my 7 over 2 down there, just so my sketch actually makes sense. So now, where is this strictly greater than 0? 
Well, there's two regions for that. So let's just use a different color to highlight these regions here. Let's do it in orange. I've got everything to the left here of a half. Okay, so everything to the left of a half there. We'd also have everything to the right here of seven over two. Okay. So in that case then, nice and straightforward here. My two solutions would be X going to be greater than seven over two. Everything to the right here is greater than 7 over 2. And we'd also have x is less than a half. Okay, so anything to the left here of a half, that's smaller than a half. So x is strictly less than a half there. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution to B. And that gives the solution there to question 5. Taking a look now at question 6 here. We've got the first three terms of a geometric series. And they're giving us k, 10, and 3k plus 5. So for the first part here, I have to show that one possible value of k is 5 and find the other possible value. So where do we begin here? Well, we're not really given too much information to go off here for part 8. I don't really suggest what method we should use here. But if we just think about how a geometric series works here, so we know the first three terms, so that's k, 10, and 3k plus 5. So with a geometric series, we can easily set up a ratio here. So we know that 10 over k should be equal to 3k plus 5 over 10. So let's just form that um, equation here. So I've got 10 over k. So 10 over k. And that should be equal to 3k plus 5. All over 10. So now if we cross multiply here. I'm going to get 10 times 10 which would be 100. And then we get k lots of 3k plus 5. Okay, like so. So now if I expand the single bracket here, I get 100 is equal to 3k squared plus 5k plus 5k there. And now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to subtract 100 off both sides because what I'd hope for here is that if I set this quadratic equal to zero, we would hopefully be able to factorize this quadratic here and get two values for k. And that's what the question is almost suggesting here. We're asked to show that one possible value of k is 5 and find the other possible value. So there's two values here that we're looking to find. Um, or one, of them, one of those values is already given, but the other one we need to find. So, like we said here, let's subtract 100 off both sides. So we get 3k squared plus 5k minus 100 is equal to 0. So from here now, like we said, we want to hopefully factorize this here and get our solutions. And in this case here, it does indeed factorize. So if you're struggling to factorize this, don't forget that you can use your calculator um, if your calculator has the, um, you know, the function to do that. So in this case here, obviously we're factorizing this now into double brackets. Place my double brackets here. Obviously they'll be equal to zero as well. So at the beginning of one of these brackets here, we're going to get 3k. And then at the beginning of the other bracket here, we'll get k. So now in these brackets here with the 3k, that would be plus 20. We get plus 20 there. And then in this bracket here, we'd get k minus 5. Okay, so that's my where I close the other bracket here. So now, once we factorize this quadratic here, this leads us to our two possible values for k. So we're actually sure that one possible value of k is 5. And that would be from this factor here. So in this case here, then k minus 5 equals 0. So therefore, k is equal to 5, hopefully nice and straightforward. Doing the same now with this factor here. This leads us to the other possible value for k. So from here then, we've got 3k plus 20. And that's equal to 0. Subtract 20 off both sides now. So subtracting 20 off both sides, we get 3k is equal to minus 20. And then finally, dividing by 3 here to get k. We get minus 20 over 3 there. Okay. So there we have it. So that's the solution to A there. So we've shown that K can equal 5. And then K is equal to minus 20 over 3. That's the other possible value there. So let's take a look now at B here. We'll do that underneath here. So given that K is 5, we're asked to find the sum of the first 12 terms. So even if you couldn't answer part A, you know, you weren't too sure where to really begin with that um, first part of the question then don't worry, you still can attempt part B and part C here. 
And the reason for that is because we know that k here is 5. So the first three terms here of this geometric series, that would be 5, 10, and then 3 times 5 plus 5. That would be 5. The middle term here is 10. And then for the last term here, or the third term I should say, then that's 3 times 5, which is 15, plus the 5, giving us 20. So from here then, we can now identify the first term, which is a. That would simply be 5. My common ratio here are, well, that would simply be, well, times by 2. 5 times 2 is 10, 10 times 2 is 20. So the common ratio here are, is equal to 2. Okay. So now to find the sum of the first 12 terms here, we simply use the formula from the formula book. You don't really have to worry about memorizing this result here. So in the formula book, it's the sum of the first n terms. So this is given as a times 1 minus r to the power of n. And that's all divided by 1 minus r there. Okay. What we're looking for here is the sum of the first 12 terms. That's s12. That's going to be a, which is 5, times 1 minus r. So r is 2. That's the power of n here, which is 12 in this case. And then we divide all of this here by 1 minus r, so that's going to be 1 minus 2 there. And all you need to do here now is just put this into your calculator. And if you do this correctly here, what you should find then for the sum of the first 12 terms is you get 20,475 there. Okay, that's the solution to b there. And then finally here for c, so it asks us to determine whether the sum to infinity exists for the same series, and you must clearly state your reasoning. So it does also say that you do not need to calculate the sum to infinity if you determine it exists. So it's only one mark for this, so we shouldn't really expect too much work here. So let's just do this here in the bottom corner. Let's do part c here. So you need to understand the condition here for when the sum to infinity exists. So for the sum to infinity to exist, the common ratio here, R, must be between minus 1 and 1. Okay, this is for the sum to infinity to exist. So in our case here, R is 2. So because R equals 2, in this case here, the sum to infinity will not exist for this same series. Okay. The sum to infinity here will not exist. And all I'd say here, just for the one mark, is it falls outside this range. So, falls outside. I'm going to room a little bit here, but falls outside of this inequality here. So minus 1 to 1 there. Okay. Like I said, it's only one mark. You don't need too much there, uh, but that would be sufficient there to get the one mark. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution there to question 6. Then we'll note question 7 here, being given that sine squared x plus cos squared x identical to 1. So for the first part here, I want to show that 1 plus tan squared x identical to sec squared x. So the main question here is how do we transform this identity here into this identity here? What I know is straight away for the second identity here that it involves a reciprocal trig function. We've got secant here. Okay, so sec squared x. So that would suggest to us here that we need to divide by cos squared x. So let's start off here with sine squared x plus cos squared x is identical to 1. Let's just write that down again. Like we said here, now what we're going to do is divide each term here by cosine squared x or cos squared x. So what we're going to get here is sine squared x over cos squared x. We'll then get cos squared x divided by cos squared x. And then finally here, we're going to get 1 over cosine squared x, or cos squared x there. 
like so. So now let's just go term by term here, it's implying where we can. So sine squared x over cos squared x, well, we know that sine x over cos x is equal to tan x, that's one of our trig identities. If we've got sine squared x over cos squared x, that's equal to tan squared x. We've got tan squared x there. We've then got cosine squared x, or cos squared x over cos squared x again. So in that case here, that would simply be 1. So anything divided by itself again would just be equal to 1. And then finally here, 1 over cos squared x. Well, like we said, that's the reciprocal trig function here for secant. Okay, so that would be sex squared x. And like you can see here now, we've got it into the correct form. Um, notice the 1 here comes before tan squared x, but it doesn't really matter. Um, but just for clarity, let me just write that. Okay, they have as well. 1 plus tan squared x there is identical to sex squared x. Okay, and there we have it. So as required, and that gives us the solution there to part A. Let's take a look at B now. So part B says, hence or otherwise, show that the integral here of tan squared x with respect to x from pi over 4 to pi is equal to minus bracket 1 plus 3 pi over 4. So let me just write down this integral here. We've got tan squared x with respect to x, and that's from pi over 4 to pi. So where do we begin here? Well, the hence or otherwise here should give you a big clue. So the hence or otherwise would suggest that we need to use our answer in part A here to help us answer part B. So if we're integrating tan squared x here, Notice we've got this identity here that involves tan squared x. What I'm going to do then is rearrange this and make tan squared x the subject. But in that case here then, we get tan squared x is equal to sex squared x there uh, minus 1. Okay. So in that case here then, I can rewrite this integral here. My limits won't change, so it'll be from pi over 4 pi but now rather than um, integrating tan squared x here i'm going to um, replace that now with sex squared x minus one we've got sex squared x minus one there we're integrating here with respect to x so now we can simply use the formula book here so when we integrate sex squared x here nice and straightforward so using the formula book here and like we said this result is given in the formula book so nothing that you have to worry about memorizing here. So in the formula, but what it's given us is sex squared kx with respect to x so dx. The result here is given as 1 over k of tan kx. Okay, obviously you need to include your um, constant of integration there. We have no limits, but in this case we do have limits here, so we don't need to worry about that. So what we're going to get here then? If we're integrating sex squared x, we're going to get 1 tan x in this case. So we don't need to write the 1, but obviously it would be 1 over 1 tan of 1x there. So we're just going to get tan x. So we get tan x there. Now don't forget the minus 1 here. If you integrate that with respect to x, that would give you minus x there. Okay, so we get tan x minus x. So because we have limits here, we don't need a constant of integration. But what we need to do here is put this into square brackets that we can evaluate this integral here, okay, and evaluate these limits. So we go from pi over 4 to pi. So in this case here then, remember we start by substituting the upper limit in here. I'm going to get tan of pi minus pi. And don't forget here we subtract the lower limit here. Okay, so it's now going to be minus It'll be tan of pi over 4, tan of pi over 4, that would then be minus pi over 4. So from here now, um, if we evaluate tan of pi and tan of pi over 4, well tan of pi is 0, 
So in the first bracket here, we simply get minus pi. So we just get rid of the bracket here. We don't need it just for the single term. I've got minus pi minus, so tan of pi over 4. Well, that's 1. So here I'm going to get minus 1 minus pi over 4. Like so. So now, let's just think about this here. So I've got minus pi minus, and then this bracket here, I've got 1 minus pi over 4. So what I've actually got here is minus pi minus 1 and then plus pi over 4 because it's minus over minus here. So minus 1 plus pi over 4 there. Okay. Obviously, we need to show this here. So minus bracket 1 plus 3 pi over 4. And we are getting towards that point here, so let's just keep simplifying. If we've got pi over 4 minus pi, then if I just get this here over common denominator, then I could write this here as minus 4 pi over 4 plus pi over 4 minus 1. We are running out of room a little bit here, so um, let me just clear a bit of room at the top here so that we can finish part B off here. Like one more line, so we've definitely got enough room here. Okay, there we have it. That should be plenty. So now we just finish off part B at the very top here. I've got minus 4 pi over 4 plus pi over 4. So that would give me minus 3 pi over 4. We get minus 3 pi over 4 there. Now we've got the minus 1 as well. So what I've got here now is this integral of tan squared x with respect to x from pi over 4 to pi. And I've got minus 3 pi over 4 minus 1. And like you can see, that's pretty close to what we need here. So to get into this form here, all I simply need to do now is just factor the minus 1 outside of the expression. So what I'm going to get here then, um, I'll just write the full expression out, or the full integral, I should say. So we've got tan squared x with respect to x from pi over 4 pi. So now if we factor the minus 1 out like we said here, I'm going to get minus bracket. So again, just making sure I get this in the correct order as well. I'll get the 1 at the beginning here, and then we've got plus 3 pi over 4 there. Okay. And there we have it. So that's required there as well. And there we have it. So that's the solution to be there. And that gives the solution to question 7 overall. Then we'll note question 8 here, where we have a question on differentiation from first principles. So we're given that x is measured in radians. All I want to do here is show from first principles that the derivative of sine x is cos x. We're also told that we can assume the formula for sine a plus or minus b without proof. And we can also assume that as h tends to 0, sine h over h tends to 1, and cos h minus 1 over h tends to 0. So this is a question here on differentiation from first principles. So don't forget the formula then for differentiation from first principles is given in the form of the book. You don't have to worry about memorizing this result. So my original function here, f of x, that would be what we're differentiating. So it would be sine x here. In this case here, then f of x plus h, that would be sine of x plus h. Okay. So now if we apply the formula here for differentiation from first principles, like we said, we're differentiating here, sine x, we get d by dx of sine x. That's going to be equal then to the limit here as h tends to 0. This would be the limit as h tends to 0 then of f of x plus h. So that's going to be sine of x plus h, with then minus f of x here, so minus sine x, and that's all divided by h. Okay, that's our first line of work in there. So now, before we can do anything else here, we need to use the compound angle formula then for sine of x plus h. So that's why it's telling us here that we can assume this formula then for sine a plus or minus b without proof. So again, 
This result here is given in the formula, but you don't have to worry about memorizing this either. So sine of a plus b, so that's given as sine a cos b, and then we have cos a sine b. Okay. Now obviously I need to apply that in terms of sine x plus h. So sine of x plus h. That would be given then as sine x cos h. We get sine x cos h, and we get plus cos x sine h there. Okay. So we put all that together now. We still have the limit here as h tends to zero. Then we've got so sine of x plus h. Well, like we said, that would just simply be this expansion here. We get sine x cos h plus cos x sine h. Then don't forget the minus sine x here. We still do include that. So minus sine x. And this is all over h. Okay. So from this point here now, what we need to do is start working towards these limits here. So at some point we need to obtain sine h over h. We also need to obtain cos h minus 1 over h as well. So what I'm going to do here now is group what I can. So I notice here I've got a sine x and a minus sine x here. If I can group those together we can factor out the sine x. So what I've got here then is the limit as h tends to 0. Like I said, I want to group the sine x's here together. So I've got sine x cos h. Then I've got the minus sine x here, so minus sine x. And then I've got cos x sine h. Okay, that would all be over h. Now, like we said, the reason that we've done this here is because we want to obtain these two limits here. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm going to factor the sine x out to begin with. So what that would give us then is cos h minus 1. If you notice here is this numerator. So that's good. That's what we need. And what I'm also going to do here is factor the cos x out here over on this side. And the reason I'm doing that then is because that would give me the sine h here that we need in this numerator. So what you also might notice here is that I need to get both of these over h. So what I'm going to do here now is basically split this off now into two fractions. And once I do that, I can apply the limits individually. Okay, so this is what we call linearity for limits. So like we said, we're going to split this off now into two individual limits. If I do it underneath here, I'm going to get the limit here as h tends to zero. Like we said, now we're going to factor out the sine x here. We get sine x. And then we get cos h minus 1 over h. So cos h minus 1 over h, like so. That's my first limit there. Now we take the limit here again individually. So I've got now the limit here. Oops, that's the limit. As h tends to 0 again. But this time now, like we said, we're going to factor the cos x over here. We get cos x. Then we get sine h over h. Okay. And then really all that's left to do here now is just consider the behavior. So as h tends to 0, what do we get here? Well, we know that sine h over h tends to 1. So this part here then, sine h over h tends to 1. So let me try this down here. Um, let's do it up here. So as h tends to 0, well, let's just start over on the left here. Well, cos h minus 1 over h, that tends to 0. So I get sine x times 0 there. And then here, we've got cosine x or cos x. And then sine h over h, so as h tends to 0, that tends to 1. So I've got cos x times 1 there. 
And what you'll notice here then is sine x times zero, well that's zero, and then we've got cos x times one, giving us cos x there. Okay, and there we have it. So that's as required, therefore, d by dx of sine x is equal to cos x as required there. Okay, and there we have it. So that's the solution there to question eight. So we take a look now at question nine here. We have a ball that's thrown upwards where the vertical height of the ball is modeled by this given function here. And we also have this diagram here. So this is figure one, and figure one shows a sketch of part of the curve. And we're also told that the curve has a maximum turning point at Q. And we can see that here on the diagram. So for the first part here, part A, we're simply asked to find H prime of X. So like we said for part A then, we're simply looking for h prime of x. We have this function here, h of x, so we're going to differentiate h of x here with respect to x. So I think this should be pretty straightforward for the first part then. So if I differentiate 4x with respect to x, nice and straightforward, I simply get 4. Now for this part here, this is a little bit more complicated. So hopefully you recognize that we now need the product rule here. So u would be minus 0.1x. And then v in this case here that would simply be e to the power of x then. Now to use the product rule, we also need u prime and v prime here. So u prime and v prime. So u prime here, that would be minus 0.1. And v prime here, again, I'd simply get e to the power of x there. So to use the product rule now, I'd do u times v prime plus v times u prime. Putting all of that together here, I get minus 0.1x times e to the power of x. So minus 0.1x times e to the power of x. And then we have u prime here times v, so that's minus 0.1 times e to the power of x there. So minus 0.1 times e to the power of x there. Okay. And there we have it. So I just leave you a solution like that. It doesn't ask for h of x here, or sorry, h prime of x. Um, in a specific form, so let's not create any more work for ourselves there. Um, that answer there is sufficient. Okay, so that's the solution to part A. We move on to B now. In part B, it says, hence or otherwise, show that the x coordinate of Q is a solution here to x equals the natural logarithm of 4 over 0.1x plus 0.1. So where do we begin here? Well, it's a hence or otherwise part, so what that suggests then is we need to use the solution here in part A to help us answer part B. And because Q here is the maximum turning point for this curve then, then what that would suggest to me is we need to use the derivative here, h prime of x. So putting all that together then, we're looking for the maximum turning point here. What I'm going to do then is take the derivative here, h prime of x, I'm going to set that equal to zero. Okay, so h prime of x here is now equal to zero. So in that case, then what I've got here is four minus 0.1x times e to the power of x, minus 0.1 um, e to the power of x there. That's all equal to zero, okay? So what I'm gonna do here now is take these parts here that involve x over to the right hand side what I'm going to get then is 4 is equal to 0.1 x e to the power of x there, like so. And this minus 0.1 e to the power of x, that will become positive 0.1 e to the power of x. So we've got plus 0.1 e to the power of x there. Okay. So what I'm looking to do here now is solve for x. So hopefully when we solve for x, we get this here. Okay. Once we get to that point, um, that's part B done. So where do we begin here then? But what I'm going to do here now, I'm going to factor out this e to the x then. Okay. So if I factor out the e to the x here, let's see what we get. So I've got 4 is equal. Like I said, factoring the e to the x out now, I get e to the power of x. Then I've got 0.1x. 0.1x there. 
And I've got plus 0.1 e to the power of x then. So if I factor the e to the x out, I just simply have plus 0.1. Okay, so that should hopefully be nice and straightforward, just factoring the e to the power of x out here. So now, like I said, we're just looking to solve for x here. So to get it into this form here then, with the natural logarithm, obviously I need to take the natural logarithm here of both sides. But before I do that, what I'm going to do is divide both sides here by 0.1x plus 0.1. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to also change the way that I'm writing this. So I'm going to put this e to the x here times 0.1x plus 0.1 on the left hand side and the four on the right hand side. don't really matter, um, I just prefer to write it in this way. So like I said, we're going to divide now both sides here by 0.1x plus 0.1. Therefore, e to the power of x is equal to 4 divided by 0.1x plus 0.1. And then finally here, we just want x now, we just need to take the natural logarithm here of both sides. So therefore, x is equal to natural logarithm of 4 all over 0.1x. That's 0.1x plus 0.1. Okay. And there we have it. That's exactly what we needed to show there. So we've got x equals a natural logarithm of 4 over 0.1x plus 0.1. That's exactly what we've got here. Okay, so that's 0.1 there. Um, and there we have it. So that's the solution to b there. Now, we're running out of room a little bit here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clear the screen here. So we have a look now at part c here. It says use the iterative formula here. So that's x n plus 1 is equal to the natural logarithm of 4 over 0.1 xn plus 0.1. We're told that x naught here, our starting value is 2.3. We're going to use this here to find values for x1, x2, x3, and x4, giving our answer to three decimal places. So x naught here, our starting value is 2.3. Now there's two ways to answer this. You can either do it by hand, which is quite a lengthy process. I wouldn't personally advise doing it by hand. But the other method is to use your calculator. So the preferred method here is to use your calculator. It's absolutely fine to use your calculator and it will save you a lot of time. Okay. So if you haven't been shown this method, it might be a little bit trickier. Um, if you haven't been shown the, like, the way to do this on your calculator. Um, if not, I'll try and walk through how you actually do this. So using your calculator here, what you're going to do to begin with is input this starting value here. So x naught equals 2.3. So this starting value here, just enter a 2.3 into your calculator. Okay. And then press either enter or execute, whatever kind of processes that calculation on your calculator. So once you do that, then it stored this 2.3 in your memory, the calculator, and it's storing that as an answer. Okay. So what I'm going to do then is on my calculator now, I'm going to put the natural logarithm of 4, it's all over, so it's going to be 0.1. So this xn now, so this xn here, that's the answer. So that's the previous value. So that's that 2.3 now. So I'm going to do 0 0.1 times ans. So ans on my calculator is the stored value. Okay, so 0 0.1 times the answer. And then don't forget the plus 0 0.1 here. Like so. When you press enter now, what this will give you here, as long as you've entered everything in correctly, this will give you x1. So in this case here for me, when I enter this here on my calculator now, x1, if I run it to three decimal places here, then I get 2.495. Okay, so that's x1 there to three decimal places. When you press enter again or execute, what you'll get then is x2. And again, if you do this correctly here, you should get 2.438. So 2.438 there. So again, if you press enter or execute, this will give you x3. So x3 here on, on my calculator, again, running it to three decimal places, this is 2.454. And then finally, one more time here to get x4. And just press enter or execute. In this case here, again, to run it to three decimal places, you should get 2.449 there. Okay. And there we have it. So that's how you do it using your calculator. If not, you need to do that by hand. So you do the natural logarithm of four 
you divide that then by 0.1 times 2.3 plus 0.1, you get this value here of x1. Then you need to do the natural log of 4 divided by 0.1 times 2.495, so on and so on, plus 0.1. And like you can see, it's the exact same method. Um, it's just the lengthier way of doing it, basically. So I would definitely recommend using a calculator for iteration questions like that. It will save you a lot of time. Okay, but there we have it. So that's the solution to C and the solution to question 9. So we take a look now at question 10 here being given this function f of x which is equal to 4x minus 1 all over 1 minus x times 1 plus 2x. And we can also see here that the function f of x can be expressed in this form here involving partial fractions. So for part a then it's asking us to find the value of the constants a and b. So to do that here we're going to take the function f of x and express it in this form here involving partial fractions. What we're going to get here is a times 1 plus 2x. We get a times 1 plus 2x. Then we're going to get b times 1 minus x. So we get b times 1 minus x there. And that will all be equal to 4x minus 1. So from here now what I want to do is either eliminate a or b. So for example, if we let x equal 1 here, if we let x equal 1 here, if I substitute that into this expression here, or this equation here, I'm going to get a times 1 plus 2 lots of 1. So I'm going to get a times 1 plus 2 there. We then have b, that would be 1 minus 1 there. That's going to be equal to 4 times 1, which is 4 minus 1 there. So we get 4 minus 1. If we simplify all of this here, I get 3a. This would be 0b. So what we've done now is eliminate the b here because obviously 0 times b would just be 0. I get 3a equals 4 minus 1, giving us 3 there. In that case here, then 3a is equal to 3. So therefore, a is equal to 1. That's the value of a. We now need to find b as well. What I need to do now is eliminate um, a here. Okay, so now if I let x equal minus a half here, if I let x equal minus a half here then, well, this now would be 0a. So we've eliminated the a then. I then get b times 1 minus minus a half there. And that would be equal to 4 times minus a half minus 1. So 1 minus minus a half, that's the same as 1 plus a half there. So it would be 3 over 2b or 3b over 2. Same thing there. So on the right hand side now, 4 times minus a half, well that would be minus 2. And then we minus 1 here. So therefore we get 3b is equal to minus 3. Sorry, 3b over 2 is equal to minus 3. Times both sides now by 2. We get 3b is equal to minus 6 there. And then finally, if we divide by 3 on both sides, we get that b is equal to minus 6 divided by 3, giving us minus 2 there. Okay? So there we have it. So that's part A done. That gives the value of A, or the constants A there, and B. So what we're going to need to do now is clear the screen here to answer part B. Um, it's quite a lengthy um, part of the question here. So let me just clear the screen to begin with. So let's take a look now at part B here. So part B says, hence or otherwise, find the, ex sorry, find the series expansion of f of x, this function here that we're working with, in ascending powers of x up to and including the x squared term. So let's just rewrite f of x here now in this form involving partial fractions. So f of x here is equal. So we found, let me just write in the value of a and b here. So a, um, that was, what did we get for a then? That was 1, and b here, that was minus 2, okay? So a was 1, b is minus 2. In that case then, what we've got here is 1 over 1 minus x there. And then for b here, well, if that's plus minus 2 over 1 plus 2x, I can just write that as minus 2 
over 1 plus 2x there. Okay. So if we're looking for the series expansion now of this function here, f of x, then what we need to do is find the binomial expansion then of 1 over 1 minus x. Do the same here now with this minus 2 over 1 plus 2x individually. So we do both of those individually, and then we can add those up at the very end to get my series expansion for this function here, f of x. Okay. So let's start then with 1 over 1 minus x here. We've got 1 over 1 minus x. Now, obviously, if we find the binomial expansion on this here, um, we need to rewrite this so we can actually find the series expansion. So I'm going to write this now in index notation here. So this would be 1 minus x there. That would be to the power of minus 1. Okay. So you don't need to write down, but I am going to do it here just before we start um, finding the series expansion here. So in your formula book, you will have the series expansion then for the binomial expansion. So we're expanding something of the form 1 plus x to the power of n. So that is equal to 1 plus nx plus n times n minus 1 times x squared. That's all over 2 times 1 or 2 factorial, however you prefer to write that. And that keeps going on. Now we only need the term up to x squared. I'm going to leave it at that point there. Okay. So what have we got here? Well, we've got 1 minus x to the power of minus 1. We now write down the series expansion for this part here to begin with. What I'm going to get here then, so hopefully we will have enough room to do all of this question here, all of this part for this question. So for 1 minus x to the power of minus 1, this is going to give me 1. Then I'm going to get minus 1 times by minus x there. That's that part done there. And then we move on to this part here then. I'm now going to get minus 1 times minus 2 times minus x all squared. Okay, so that part there is squared. And it's all divided here by 2 factorial. That would be 2 times 1 there. Like I said, that would keep going on, but we're not bothered about any term past the x squared term. So now let's just simplify this here. I've got 1 minus 1 times minus x. That would give me plus x on its own. And then here I've got minus 1 times minus 2, so that's um, positive 2 there. We also have minus x squared, so that's minus x times minus x. That would give me x squared. So I've got 2x squared over 2. That would give us plus x squared there when we cancel down. Okay. And like we said, that would keep going on, but we're not really too bothered about any term past the x squared term. So that's the first part done there. So that's 1 over 1 minus x. And now let's consider here minus 2 over 1 plus 2x. So 1 plus 2x here. So again, we need to write this now in index notation. So what I've got here is minus 2 times by 1 plus 2x. And that's the power of minus 1. So just similar to what we did here for the first part. Again, we just need to write this in index notation so that we can find the binomial expansion for this expression here. So now again, let's just find the expansion here using this result here. So what am I going to get here? Well, keep the minus 2 on the outside to begin with. So we multiply through by the minus 2 at the very end. So just leave the outside for now. We're going to get minus 2 here on the outside. So inside now we're going to get 1. That's how it starts here. So 1. So then we're going to get plus. So now I get minus 1 times by 2x. Then we're going to get minus 1 times by minus 2. Now we times it by 2x all squared. So just be very careful here with how you present this sign. So 2x all squared. And again, this will be divided here by 2 factorial. So that's going to be 2 times 1. And we'll just write it as 2 factorial for now. And again, this would keep going on, but we're not really bothered past that point. Okay. So again, we've still got the minus 2 on the outside. Let's simplify this first before we multiply through by minus 2. So I've got 1. Minus 1 times 2x, that would be minus 2x there. So here I've now got minus 1 times minus 2, so that's positive 2 there. We then also have 2x all squared, so it would be 4x squared. So I've got 2 times 4x squared, so it would be 8x squared. Then we divide it by 2, that would give me plus 4x squared there. Okay, and again this just keeps going on. 
like so. So now what I want to do here is multiply through by the minus 2. So multiplying through now by minus 2, here I get minus 2 times 1, which is minus 2. Minus 2 times minus 2x. So again, just be very careful with the signs here. This would give me positive 4x. We get plus 4x there. And I've got 4x squared times that by minus 2, and that would give me minus 8x squared there. Okay, and again, that would just keep going on and on. So we're pretty much done now. So we just finish it off over here. And let's just do it in a different color just to highlight this being the actual solution. So therefore, if you consider now the actual um, original function here, f of x, I've got 1 over 1 minus x minus 2 over 1 plus 2x. In this case here, that would be this series expansion. So 1 plus x plus x squared plus and so on added together with this expansion here. So minus 2 plus 4x minus 8x squared. If I do it underneath here, I've got 1 plus x plus x squared. And then we add on this expansion here. So don't subtract this. Now, the minus 2, I dealt with that in the actual expansion here. So you don't subtract this expansion here. Um, you would be making a mistake if you were to do that. Now I add minus 2 plus 4x minus 8x squared. I was only doing this now up to the x squared term because that's all we need here. So including the x squared term there. Um, so now we just simplify here. 1 plus minus 2, that would give me minus 1. I get minus 1 there. I've then got x plus 4x. That would give me positive 5x, so plus 5x. And then finally we've got x squared plus minus 8x squared, so it would give me minus 7x squared there. Okay, and there we have it, so that's the series expansion of this original function f of x there in ascending powers of x up to and including the x squared term. That's part B done. So again, we're going to need to clear the screen one more time here now to have a go at part B. Oh, sorry, part C even, so let me just clear the screen. Go back to my original pen color as well. So for part C then, just one mark here to finish with, we're asked to find the range of values um, for x for which this expansion is valid. So, again let's just consider the original parts now. So I've got 1 over, got 1 over 1 minus x there. And then B here, this is minus 2 all over 1 plus 2x. Okay, so we consider these two parts here individually now. What I've got here is 1 minus x the power of minus 1. So now, this would be valid. So this is valid when the modulus of x, oh sorry, the modulus of minus x here, so let me just get rid of that. So the modulus of minus x here is less than 1. The modulus of minus x is less than 1, but obviously if you take the modulus of this negative here, well, this minus x here, then um, we don't need to worry about the minus, so I just get the modulus of x here less than 1. So in other words, x can be between minus 1 and 1. So that's for that part there. We're just going to do the same here now for minus 2 over 1 plus 2x. Um, in fact, just don't worry about the minus 2 here. Um, all we're concerned about is the 1 plus 2x. So if I write this down, 1 plus 2x. Obviously, we're just turning it through by minus 2 at the very end, but that won't change where it's going to be valid for. I've got 1 plus 2x. Again, that would be to the power of minus 1 here. This is valid when. This would be valid when the modulus of 2x here is less than 1. If I both sides now by 2, we have the modulus of x here being less than a half. In that case, then, this would be minus a half. to a half. Now, we only need the range of values here for x for which this expansion is valid. So I've got two different inequalities here. So how do I decide the range of values for x here for which this expansion would be valid? Well, think about this on a number line. Let's say I've got minus 1 at this end. Let's say I've got positive 1 at this end here. I'd have 0 somewhere in the middle here. I'd also have minus a half and positive a half there. 
So for this part here, that's valid when x is between minus a half and a half. I would say be like so. And then for the other part here, so this one minus x to the power of minus one, that's valid when x is between minus one and one. If I do that one a different color, let's do it in orange. That would be valid for this region here. Now, for the full function here, it would have to be the smaller um, inequality here. So in this case here, this is valid. Um, in fact, let me just rewrite this. So range of values. Or part C here, so the range of values for X for which this expansion is valid would be this um, region here. So it says the modulus of X being less than a half. Or alternatively, you could write it as this here. Okay, either of those are absolutely fine. But like I can say, it must be this smaller inequality here. Okay, and there we have it. So that was quite a long question. Um, that's the solution to C, and that gives the solution there to question 10. So we take a look now at question 11 here, where we have two parts. Let's begin with part A. So in part A, we have to prove that sine 2 theta plus sine theta all over 1 plus cos 2 theta plus cos theta is identical to tan theta. Now, what I noticed straight away here with this um, trig identity here is we have the double angle formula for sine and cosine. Let's just write those down to begin with. So sine 2 theta, that's given as 2 sine theta times by cosine theta. That's sine 2 theta. We also have cosine 2 theta, so cos 2 theta here. What you need to remember here is for cos 2 theta, we can express this as cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. And from here, we use one of the trig identities that we learned in the first year of study for A-level math. So that is sine squared theta plus cos squared theta identical to 1. And what I can do from here then, using this identity here, I can make either sine squared theta the subject or cos squared theta the subject and substitute that into this expression here. And if you do that, we obtain two more results here. The first result is 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. And then the other result here is going to be 2 cos squared theta minus 1. So now if we go back to this identity here. Well, we have sine 2 theta, so that's 2 sine theta cos theta. We have 2 sine theta cos theta. We also have plus sine theta, so don't forget the plus sine theta here in the new rear. So plus sine theta. And this is all over 1 plus cos 2 theta. We've got 1 plus. Now, like we said, for cosine 2 theta here, it isn't as straightforward because we now have three possible results that we use here. So the question here is which of these three, um, you know, formulae for cos 2 theta do we use? And the answer to that is to think about how we end up with this tan theta here. If we're looking for tan theta, then we'd expect to get sine theta over cos theta at some point. So for sine theta over cos theta, again, if I just think about what I've got here already in the numerator, I see straight away that I can factor out a sine theta here. Okay, so I can factor out a sine theta here in the numerator. But what I'd expect then is in the denominator now, I'm going to be able to factor out a cos theta here. Okay, and what I'd hopefully expect then is I'm going to get a common factor here in the numerator and the denominator. I can then cancel both of those common factors and we're going to end up with some form of sine theta over cos theta, giving us the tan theta that we need here. So in that case here then, for the cos 2 theta, I'm going to keep it in terms of cosine. So that would be 2 cos squared theta minus 1. We get 1 plus 2 cos squared theta minus 1 here. And then don't forget we've got the plus cos theta here. Okay. But like we said, we see straight away in the numerator here, we can factor out the sine theta. If I factor out the sine theta here, I'm going to get sine theta. So that would be 2 cos theta plus 1. 
So two cards for you, that's supposed to be for you there. Plus one. And this is all divided here then. And what you notice here now is this one and this minus one, it would just be zero. So I get two cos squared for you plus cos for you. And again, now we can factor out the cos for you here. I get cos for you. I'm going to get two cos for you plus one. So what we've got here now is just like we said, we've got a common factor here of two cos for you plus one. We can cancel those. And what I get left here then with is sine theta over cos theta, which we know is identical to tan theta there. Okay, that's identical to tan theta as required there for part A. Okay, so there we have it. So that's the solution to part A there. Hopefully, not too challenging, I don't think. Um, just realize on knowing the double angle formula for sine 2 theta and cos 2 theta. Okay, so that's the first four marks there for question 11. So now let's take a look here at B. So let's just clear the screen here for B. We don't need anything that we've already got here. So for B then, it says hence solve for theta being between 0 and 360 degrees. So we've got sine 2 theta plus sine theta all over 1 plus cos 2 theta plus cos theta. So notice straight away that's the same as what we have here. And that's equal now to 3 cot theta. So part B then, I've got this result here, which was the identity that we had in part A. So we know that that part here on the left hand side, this is all tan theta. Okay, that's what we um, proved in part A. So what I've got here then for part B is tan theta is equal to 3 cot theta. Okay. So tan theta is equal to 3 cot theta here. So how do we solve this trigonometric equation here? Well, this is actually not too bad, I don't think, if we just think about how we write cot theta here. So don't forget that's a reciprocal trig function for tangent. So what I've got here then is tan theta is equal to 3 over tan theta. So now what I'm going to do here is multiply both sides by tan theta. So therefore, what we get here is tan squared theta is equal to 3. So now we're looking to solve for theta here. So in this case here, I want to get rid of the square term here. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides here. So therefore, tan theta is equal to the square root of 3. And don't forget we should have the plus or minus here. So plus or minus the square root of 3. So in that case then, we get two solutions here. So my first solution, theta, that's when we take tan inverse or arc tan, whichever you prefer, of the square root of positive 3. So that's just going to be the square root of 3. So from here now, what you need to do is just put this into your calculator here. So if I do tan inverse of the square root of 3, I get 60 degrees. My first solution. And remember, um, tan repeats every 180 degrees. So my next solution here would be 60 plus 180. So that would be 240 degrees. And again, if I add 180 to 240 here, that will take me outside of this interval here for theta. So we would omit the next solution there. So for tan inverse of root 3, we get two solutions there of 60 degrees and 240 degrees. And then my other solution here, then we have theta equals tan inverse of minus root 3. So again, all you need to do is just put this into your calculator here. Um, I didn't mention it, but obviously we are working in degrees, so you don't need to worry about um, anything to do with radians. Just obviously make sure your calculator is in degrees mode. Um, so in this case here, tan inverse of minus root 3. So again, you put this into your calculator. The first solution here would be minus 60 degrees. Now obviously we can't include that because it falls outside of this range here, this interval. So we omit that solution, but it's important because now if I add 180 to minus 60 here, that gives me 120 degrees. So that's the first solution there now that we have for tan inverse of minus root 3. And again here, if I had, um, I'll add 180 to 120 here, that gives me 300 degrees. Okay. Obviously, if I add um, 180 here to 300, that would fall outside of this interval here. So again, we would omit the next solution. So that gives us two more solutions there. So therefore, for this um, equation here, this trigonometric equation, we get four solutions. So therefore, theta is equal 
So putting these in order, I've got 60 degrees. I have 120 degrees. I have 240 degrees. And then finally we have 300 degrees here. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the solution to B and the solution to question 11. So we take a look now at question 12 here. It says use calculus and the substitution x equals sine theta. Prove that the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared with respect to x is equal to arc sine x plus c. So to begin with here, we take the substitution then of x equals sine theta. To begin with, I'm going to find dx by d theta. So dx by d theta here. If I simply differentiate x with respect to theta, I'm going to get cos theta here. Okay, if you differentiate sine, you get cos. So if we've got sine theta, that would give me cos theta. Now, what I'm going to do here is get this in terms of dx on its own. Now, we shouldn't really do this. You can't really treat a differential like this as a fraction. But for these type of questions here, we do. In this case here, then, dx is equal to cos theta d theta. So what we're going to do then eventually is replace this dx here with this here. Okay. So that's the first thing to do here. What I can also do here then is replace this 1 minus x squared here. So I can substitute x equals sine theta into my denominator here. Okay. So what I've got now is the integral here of 1 over, I've got 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. That would be 1 minus sine theta squared. Like so. And we've got dx here, but we know that dx is equal to cos theta d theta. We times that by cos theta d theta. Okay. So what do we do next? Well, the square root here, 1 minus sine theta all squared. Well, what this would give me here then is the integral. So I'll ignore the numerator for now. So for my denominator here, I'm going to get the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta. 1 minus sine squared theta. And for my numerator here, I'm going to replace that now. So this 1 here, if I just times it by cos theta, I simply get cos theta here in the numerator. Okay. And so with respect here then to theta, so d theta. But now we just think about the um, denominator here then. So if we use the identity here of sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is identical to 1. And I've got 1 minus sine squared theta here. So if I just um, rearrange this so that sine squared theta is the subject, in that case then sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cos squared theta. What I'm going to get here then is the integral of cos theta all over the square root then. I've got 1 minus sine squared theta. That's going to be minus 1. And minus is cos squared theta here. Like so. Again, this is with respect to theta. So in this case here, 1 minus 1, they'll just cancel. Now I've got minus minus cos squared theta. That would give me positive cos squared theta. We've got here now is the integral of cos theta all over the square root of cos squared theta. This is with respect to theta here. And obviously, if you've got the square root of cos squared theta, that would simply be cos theta. Okay. What I've got now is the integral here of cos theta over cos theta with respect to theta. Okay. And clearly, cos theta divided by cos theta is 1. What I've actually got now is the integral of 1 here, d theta. So if I integrate 1 here with respect to theta, that would simply give me theta. Okay, so that's theta. 
And because we have no limits here on the integral, we do need the constant of integration, so plus c there. Now we're not done here because we need to show that this result here is equal to arc sine x plus c. So how do we get this arc sine x plus c here? Well, if x, so if we just write this down, if x is equal to sine theta, in this case here, theta would be arc sine x. Okay, that would simply give us theta on its own. Take sine inverse of both sides, that would be arc sine x. In this case here then, so therefore, the integral here of this result, um, I'm going to have room at the bottom. Probably won't have room at the bottom, so I'm just ignore that. Let me just write it here. It says theta plus c then, if I just replace theta with arc sine x, that would simply be arc sine x. So I get arc sine x plus c as required there. Okay, like I said, I'm running out of room a little bit here. I have it just about enough room there. And then we have it, so that's the solution there to question 12. Moving on to question 13, notice we've got two points here, the points A and B, and they have coordinates of minus 1, 0, 4, and 5, minus 8, K, respectively. Now we're given that the distance from A to B is 5 root 5 units, and we're asked to show that one possible value for K is minus 1, and find the other value. So how do we answer part A here? Well, what we're looking at here is the distance between two points, in this case now in 3D space. So let's just recall the formula then for the distance between two points. So we use D here to represent the distance, and this is the square root. So to begin with, we have x2 minus x1 all squared. And then we do the same with the y coordinates and the z coordinates here. We have y2 minus y1, that's all squared. And we do the same here with the z component, or the z um, coordinates, I should say. Um, so it would be z2 minus z1, all squared there. Okay. So in this case here, the point A, I'm going to take that as x1, y1, z1, x1, y1, and z1. And this point here for B, that would be x2, y2, and z2, okay? So we also know the distance here, D, that is 5 root 5. So we have 5 root 5, that's equal then to the square root here. So we've got x2 minus x1 all squared. So like we can see here, x2 is 5 minus minus 1 here, which is x1. So just be careful with the signs here as well. So 5 minus minus 1 all squared. We then got y2 minus y1 all squared. So y2 here is minus 8, minus 0 here all squared. And then finally, for the z coordinates here, I've got k minus 4 all squared. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do here is get rid of this square root now on the right hand side. So to do that I'm going to take the, or basically I'm just going to square both sides. So on the left hand side we get 5 root 5 all squared. 5 root 5 all squared. And then on the right hand side here we get everything underneath the square root here. So 5 minus minus 1 all squared, that's the same as 5 plus 1 squared. This bracket here, then, that would just be minus 8 all squared. And then for this final bracket here, we'll just leave it as it is. So it would be k minus 4 all squared. Okay. So now let's simplify here. So 5 root 5 all squared. So you can just put that either into your calculator here or just do it by hand. So 5 squared would be 25. Um, the square root of 5 squared, that would be 5. So 25 times 5 that would give us 125 there. That's going to be equal then to 6 squared here, so that's 36. Minus 8 squared, that would be positive 64 there. And then for this final part here, this final bracket squared, don't do anything with that, just leave it as it is. So that's going to be k minus 4 all squared. 
And the reason we don't do anything with that such as expanding it here is because we want to solve for k. So it's easier to just leave it in this form for now. So here, I'm going to get k minus 4l squared. 36 plus 64, that would be 100. And this is all equal to 125. So now here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 100 off both sides. So I get k minus 4l squared. That's equal to 125 minus 100, giving us 25 there. So again, like we just said, we're just looking to solve for k here. So I'm now going to take the square root of both sides here. I'm going to get k minus 4. And don't forget to include the negative solution here to this square root. I've got positive 5 and negative 5. So I get plus or minus 5 there. And this leads us now to our two solutions here, or the two possible values for k. So I get one solution then, or one value for k here, when we take positive 5. So k is equal to 5 plus 4, giving us 9. And my other solution here, that's when we take um, the negative here, so minus 5. So I'm going to get minus 5 plus 4, giving me minus 1 there, as required. So... That gives the two possible values there. So we've shown that one possible value for k is minus 1. That's that solution there. And then the other value is 9. Okay. That's the solution to a. Let's just clear the screen here so we can answer the final three parts. So for b now, we're given another point c here, which has coordinates of minus 3, minus 14, and 4. And it also says using k equals minus 1 for the point b. So now we can replace k here with minus 1. So b then would be 5, minus a, and minus 1. Okay. So in this case here, now finding these two vectors here, so the vector bc and the vector ac. Again, should hopefully be pretty straightforward here um, for part b. So for the, ve the vector here, bc. So in this case here, this would be the position vector for c, minus the position vector for b. So I'll talk to you how you present the vector here. You can either do that as a column vector or in ijk notation. I'm just going to do it here as a column vector, but like I said, ijk no notation is also absolutely fine. So for our column vector here then, well, I'm going to get minus 3 minus um, the 5 here. I'm going to get minus 3 minus 5 there. And then I'm going to get minus 14 minus minus 8. So again, just be very careful with the signs here. So minus 14 minus minus eight and then finally we've got four minus minus one like so so we just evaluate this here then so minus three minus five i get minus eight there minus 14 plus eight then so minus minus eight that's the same as plus eight that would give me minus six there and then finally, 4 minus minus 1, that would just give us 5. Same as 4 plus 1, giving us 5 there. So then for the vector BC there, we get minus 8, minus 6, and 5. And then we just do the same here for the vector AC. In this case, this would be the position vector for C, minus the position vector for A. So what I'm going to get here then, so again, it would be minus 3, minus minus 1. Get minus 3, uh, minus minus 1. Um, then for the um, J component here, so for C then it's going to be minus 14, minus 0. And then finally we're going to get 4 here, minus 4. So we just evaluate this here. We've got minus 3 plus 1 there, so it would give me minus 2. Got minus 14 minus 0, so that's just minus 14. And then 4 minus 4 is 0. I get minus 2, minus 14, and 0 there for the vector AC. So that's part B done. Um, another two marks there in the bag. So now let's take a look here at C. So now we have to find the magnitude here of the vectors BC and AC. So obviously this is again pretty straightforward now because we've just answered um, or we've just found the vectors for BC and AC. Now for the magnitude here of the vector BC, we just simply apply in Pythagoras. So in this case, this would be the square root. 
it's going to be minus 8 squared plus minus 6 squared plus 5 squared. So minus 8 squared plus minus 6 squared plus 5 squared. In this case here, I'm going to get the square root. Minus 8 squared, that would be 64. Minus 6 squared, that would be 36. And 5 squared is 25. So we simplify all of this here. Um, or we evaluate everything underneath the square root here. I want to get the square root of 125, which we can also write as 5 root 5 there. Okay, so that's the magnitude there for the vector. BC. I'm just doing the same now for the vector um, AC here, so finding the magnitude of the vector AC. In this case here, we take the square root. It's now going to be minus 2 squared. Then got minus 14 squared. And obviously, if you take the square of 0, that would just be 0. So here, if we just simplify this then. Well, minus 2 squared is 4. Minus 14 squared would be 196. So I get the square root of 4 plus 196. That's equal to the square root of 200. Which we can also write here as 10 root 2. Okay. So that's part C done. And then finally here, for part D, just one mark now. It says, hence or otherwise, describe the triangle ABC. So how do we describe the triangle ABC here? Now it is only one mark, so we shouldn't really expect any, you know, um, real amount of work here. Basically just one line or so should get us the mark here. So when it asks you to describe a shape like this when you're using vectors, it's just asking for the type of shape that you have. So if we have a triangle here, it's just basically asking is this an equilateral triangle, an isosceles triangle, a right angle triangle, or a scaling triangle. So in this case here, to answer this, let's just look at the length then of the sides here. So we've just found the magnitude of BC and the magnitude of AC. The magnitude of BC, that was equal to 5 root 5. The magnitude of vector AC here, that was 10 root 2. And then for the remaining side here, we actually had that in part A. So the distance from A to B. So the magnitude then of the vector AB here, well, that is 5 root 5. So what you need to spot here now is that for two of the sides here, the magnitude, so the length, um, since we're looking at this in a geometric context, is equal. So therefore, the magnitude of the vector AB is equal to the magnitude then of the vector BC therefore in this case what we have now is an isosceles triangle so therefore ABC is an isosceles triangle okay and there we have it so that's all we need there for the one mark um, to basically finish question 13 so there we have it so we, ha we answered part A at the beginning and we have part B part C and then finally part D there. And that gives us the solution there to question 13. And finally then, if we take a look here at the very last question on this paper, question 14, we've got the curve C, which has parametric equations defined as x equals tan t minus 1 and y equals 4 sec t. The curve C is shown in figure 2 above. We can see that here on this diagram. We're also told that the curve C intersects the y-axis at the point P. So for the first part here then, part A, to show that p has coordinates of 0, k root 2, where k is a constant to be found. So to answer part a then, what we need to think about here is this point of intersection. So the curve c intersects the y-axis at the point p, and that is when x equals 0. And we can see that here from the coordinates. So when x equals 0, in this case here then, using the parametric equations that we have defined here, and we can see that tan p minus 1 is equal to 0. And then we solve for t here, we get tan t equals 1. And we take tan inverse here on both sides, we get t. That's tan inverse of 1. 
and that is equal to pi over 4. Okay, so do ensure that you're working in radians here. So t is equal to pi over 4. Now, how does this help us here? Well, what we're looking for is the y coordinate here. Okay, we know the value of t here, so that's pi over 4. So now for y here, then, the y is equal to 4 sec t. That's the same as 4 over cos t. So if t is equal to pi over 4, and in this case here, then, y is equal to 4 over cos of pi over 4, over cos of pi over 4. Well, cos of pi over 4, that is 1 over root 2. So what I've got here is 4 divided by 1 over the square root of 2. So in this case here, this is the same as 4 times root 2. So I get 4 root 2 over 1, which would simply give us 4 root 2 there. Okay, so we get 4 root 2 there. So in this case here, then k is simply 4. Okay, so it would be 4 there. That gives us the first three marks there for part A. So again, we took up pretty much the full screen um, just to answer part A there. So let's just clear that. Um, but do take a note here that k is equal to 4. So now let's take a look here at part B. In part B then it says find an equation of the tangent to the curve C at the point P. So the point P here, well we know the coordinates of that, that is 0, 4, root 2 there. Okay. We want to give our answer in the form y equals mx plus c, where m and c are thirds. So how do we answer part b here? Well, if you're looking for the equation of the tangent, the first thing that we need here is the derivative. Okay, so we need dy by dx. So we need dy by dx. Obviously, we're working with parametric equations here. So to find dy by dx here when you're working with parametric equations, this would be, so it would be um, dy by dt here. So let me just get this the right way around. dy by dt. Then we times that here by dt over dx, okay, like so. so. What I need to do now is differentiate y here with respect to t, differentiate x here with respect to t, perform this multiplication, and that would give me dy by dx there, okay. So in this case then, dy by dt, you differentiate 4 sec t here, you get 4 sec t times tan t. So we get 4 sec t times tan t. Okay, so that's dy by dt found. Doing the same now for dt by dx here. So as we begin with, I'll find dx by dt and then take the reciprocal. So dx by dt. So dx by dt here. Well, differentiating tan t minus 1 here with respect to um, t, that would be nice and straightforward. That would just simply give me sec squared t. Okay, so I get sec squared t there. Obviously, if I want um, dt by dx now, taking the reciprocal here, so dt by dx, that is 1 over sec squared t. Okay. So now to find dy by dx, and all of this together now, we have dy by dt, so dy by dt is 4 sec t times tan t, times tan t, and then we times this here with dt by dx, so that's 1 over x squared t. So here then this would give me 4 sec t, 4 sec t times tan t. That will all be over sec squared t. Okay. So in this case here, we can cancel down by this factor here of sec t. So I'm going to get 4 tan t over sec t here like so. Let's just keep simplifying here. 
So what I've got here now is for tan t over sec t. Well, I know tan t here, I can write that as sine t over cos t. And sec t here, that is 1 over cos t. It's a reciprocal trig function for cosine. So again, just simplifying here, I've got 4 times sine t over cos t. And that is all divided then by sec t here, which is 1 over cos t. Okay. So in this case here now where I have a fraction, so this is 4 sine t over cos t divided by 1 over cos t. When you've got a fraction divided by another fraction here, if the denominator of both of these individual fractions is the same, in this case they are, they're both cos t, and we can just divide both of those together. I'll just cancel those out, I should say. So what I get then, 4 sine t there. Okay. So that is dy by dx. Okay. Like the, just quite a bit of work there just to find dy by dx. So again, take a note of this here. I'm going to have to clear the screen so we can uh, carry on here then with part B. And for part B then, like we said, dy by dx is equal to 4 sine t. Now, we're looking for the equation of the tangent to the curve C at the point P. So we found dy by dx, so we need the gradient then at this point here, p. So at p, which has coordinates of 0 and 4 root 2 there. What we need then is the value of t for this point here. If you remember then from part a, um, when we set x equal to 0, this was when t was equal to pi over 4. Okay. So at p, which is 0, 4 root 2. And it also has t equals pi over 4. Then the gradient at this point here, dy by dx, that is equal to 4 sine pi over 4. Okay. So 4 sine pi over 4. So sine of pi over 4, that's 1 over root 2. So I get 4 times 1 over root 2 which would give me 4 over root 2. And what I'm going to do here just to make life a little bit easier, I'm going to rationalize this um, just to make the calculations a little bit easier as we progress. In this case, I'd get 4 root 2 over 2, which we can um, cancel down to give us 2 root 2 there. Okay. So the gradient at this point here, P, would be 2 root 2. Then finally here, we now just need to use the equation of a straight line. So in this case here then, we're going to get, um, use the equation of a straight line. I'm going to get y minus y1. Let me just write this down. y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. My y1 here would be this coordinate here at this point p. So again, that would be 4 root 2. So I get y minus 4 root 2 and that is equal to m times x minus x1 so m here that's 2 root 2 and we times that by x minus x1 but x1 here is 0 we get x minus 0 there but in this case here then we just simplify all of this here I've got y minus 4 root 2 that is equal to 2 root 2x obviously we times that by 0 you just get 0 again. So y minus 4 root 2 is equal to 2 root 2x. And then finally, we get it in this form here that it's asking for y would be equal to 2 root 2x plus 4 root 2 there. Okay. And there we have it. So that's the equation of the tangent to the curve C at the point P there. That gets us 7 marks. And then finally, let's take a look then at the very last part here, part C. So it says the tangent to the curve C at the point P intersects the x-axis now at the point Q. If you think about just kind of drawing the tangent here, um, this will not be perfect at all. Let's just to kind of think about drawing this tangent here. It will look, say, something like that. Okay. The point P. Obviously, that should be a straight line, but I'm doing it freehand on a tablet. Um, so it's never going to be quite perfect. That's my point P there. And that's my tangent there. So it now intersects the x-axis here at this point here, which we're going to call Q. Okay. 
So now it asks us to find the area of the triangle OPQ. So what we're looking for now, doing a different color, is the area of this triangle here, O, the P, the Q. Okay. And the good thing about this is obviously this would form a right angle triangle. Okay. That's a right angle triangle there. So we just think about this here. Well, obviously the height of this triangle that would be from the origin here to P, and P has a height then, but it has a Y coordinate of 4 root 2, so the height would just simply be um, 4 root 2 minus 0, giving me 4 root 2 there for the height. What we need now is just simply the base here, okay, the length of the base. So what I basically need to find here is the, the coordinates of Q then, where it intersects with the X axis here. So I'm hoping we might just about have enough room here to do this. So the point Q here, that is when um, Y in this case is equal to 0. Okay, so I'm going to set y equal to 0 here. I get 2 root 2x plus 4 root 2. And that is equal to 0. Okay. So now I'm looking to solve for x here. Just find the x coordinate. So I subtract 4 root 2 off both sides. I get 2 root 2x is equal to minus 4 root 2. And then finally here, divide both sides now by this 2 root 2 here in front of the x. So x is equal to minus 4 root 2 all over 2 root 2. So I'm running out of room a little bit here. Um, let me just do it up here actually. So C. So I've got 2 root 2x. Let me just write it all down again. Plus 4 root 2 is equal to 0. We'll try the 4 root 2 off both sides. So I get 2 root 2x is equal to minus 4 root 2. And like we said, divide both sides by 2 root 2. We get that x is equal to minus 4 root 2. Minus 4 root 2 over 2 root 2. That would simply give us minus 2 there. Okay. The x coordinate here is minus 2. So what that means then is the length of the base here is 2 units. And from here then we can simply find the area nice and straightforward. So in this case then, do it in orange again. So the area here... Nice and straightforward. Think about your GCSE maths here. Um, that would just be the base times by the height divided by 2. So base times by height divided by 2. So the base here is 2 units. Times that by the height here, which is 4 root 2. And we divide that by 2. Okay. So 2 times 4 root 2 all over 2. Well, 2 times 4 root 2, that would give me 8 root 2. So area here. I would say that would be 2 times 4 root 2 all over 2. I'm going to get 8 root 2 over 2. And we can cancel down to give 4 root 2 there. Okay. So this area here, this triangle, the C is 4 root 2 there. Okay. And there we have it. So that gives the solution to C there. That gives the solution to question 14. And that brings us to the end of this paper then. And that's the very last question there. Um, so if you have made it to the very end, um, well done. It has been quite a long um, paper, I know. Um, but, you know, credit to making it to the end. I hope this paper's been helpful. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video here, the introduction, do check out our website, ajmaths.co.uk. We've got plenty more um, worksheets, revision videos, and we will also be uploading paper two and paper three very shortly before the upcoming um, 2023 exam. So again, thank you very much for watching and good luck in your upcoming exams.